and it's showing that neck strengthening can make a difference in lowering head acceleration. That's what we're all about, especially in the world of repetitive head impacts. Welcome to the Next Level Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Dickinson. Dr. Thomas Kaminsky hails from the University of Delaware, where he works as a concussion and neck researcher, a professor, and the director of the university's athletic training program. Concussions, brain injuries, CTE, these are a focus in today's sports, but two decades ago, they weren't on anyone's radar. Dr. Kaminsky has been working in this area since the late 90s, and he's exactly the man to talk to if you want to learn about how the neck plays a role in concussion risk. We were also joined by Amanda Delaney, a PhD student working in Dr. K's lab. She filled us in on the next level study currently underway at the University of Delaware Women's Soccer Program. Please enjoy. So thank you, Dr. Kaminsky and Amanda, for joining me today. It's an honor to have you guys. Yeah. Hey, Scott. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to, to partner uh, with you and collaborate with your company, Next Level, in advancing the science of next strengthening as a prophylactic intervention in mitigating concussion risk and uh, risk of repetitive head impacts in soccer. I mean, that's the world we live in. And uh, it's, it's really been an honor and a pleasure to partner with you and your company. So. I'm uh, I'm humbled to hear that, and, and Amanda, welcome to you. Hi, Scott. Thanks for having us on here. Yeah, of course. So, uh, Dr. K, I'd I'd like to um, zoom back or uh, rewind the clock, if you if you might uh, be willing to. Now, in popular culture, we talk about concussions, CTE. These are all things that everyone is concerned with. Uh, football, soccer. Uh, these are sports that we. Um, They get a lot of attention for head injuries. Can you rewind the clock to when this first got on your radar and and how you got into researching this topic? Sure. Yeah. You know, as a certified athletic trainer the last 40 years or so, um, you know, concussions have always been in our world. Certainly the science of concussion has advanced immensely over the last 20, 25 years. I mean, all one has to do is just look at the number of publications around the topic of sport-related concussion from the early 2000s to where we are in 2022, just an explosion of of, of, uh, publications that have helped to advance the science without question. As related to my world, my world, is really been centered around repetitive head impacts and concussions in the sport of soccer, primarily women's soccer. I, between 1996 and 2002, I worked at the University of Del- or University of Florida with the women's soccer team there, and I had a colleague who was a neuropsychologist, Dwayne Beatty, who. Uh, that was early, early in the, in the stages of doing neuropsychological testing with concussed athletes. Mm. It had been in their world for a long time, the neuropsychology world, but it hadn't really transferred over to the sport world that much. Mm. And he was uh, a colleague at Florida and uh, we teamed up and partnered. And from that point forward, I really took an interest primarily in women's soccer I was interested in concussion because, as you know, women's soccer carries a high risk for concussion. But then that kind of spilled over into this area of repetitive head impacts. And certainly soccer sets itself up well for a sport that has repetitive head impacts because unique to the sport is the act of heading a ball. So uh, my journey began then. I mean, we were literally counting headers at practices and games. And, uh, and, I, and so I kind of took up that space. I, I, I really was one of the first in, in the world that was, that was tracking headers in that regard. We started publishing uh, the early 2000s. And then it just kind of has flourished from there because there's a lot more players in that space now than there ever was. And uh, you know, I, I look back at my early time and 
you know, people were looking at me like I was from Mars. You know, what are you studying that stuff for? But, you know, in, in t- today's medical world, you know, repetitive hem- head impacts is a big deal. Wow. And it's amazing you were there really, really from the start. And something that that I just more recently started thinking about is the difference between concussions where there's like really a, a diagnosis put on the player versus these subconcussive events that really can fly under the radar. So, so that's been on, uh, on your radar for a long time. Um, but so, so how, how do you think about the differences between these subconcussive events and concussions as it relates to brain damage, CTE development? Is that, is that a really big question? Is that tough to, to pin down or can you talk about it? Yeah, it, that, that's the elephant in the room without question. You know, when you you sit in uh, the, the circles that I've sat in with, whether it's players, uh, coaches, uh, medical personnel, what are the long term ramifications of that? Fortunately, if you think about soccer, and I'll just use the United States for an example. If you think about soccer in the United States, kids as early as fives start to maybe play, you know, three, four, they're kicking it around, but, you know, age five. So they're more organized. And the number of players between ages of five and say 14 are pretty high in the United States. And then a lot of times what happens is when kids get to high school, that number shrinks a little bit. So they don't play competitively anymore. And then they go through their college or their high school career. And then, a few of them will go on and play collegiately. Well, from a repetitive head impact standpoint, that's a good thing because, you know, these people are dropping out. And so they don't have this long-term exposure Hmm. to repetitive head impacts because we think what's happening is it's those individuals who've had this career of long-term repetitive head impacts, young youth players, high school players, travel team mixed in there, collegiate level, and then perhaps play professionally. Those are the ones I think we need to be concerned about. I honestly believe that those kids who had experienced repetitive head impacts due to soccer heading through their high school career and then quit playing probably are very, very minimal risk. Now, there's probably a subset of those individuals who have experienced concussions mm-hmm. as well as, you know, a, a large number of repetitive hemp head impacts. Perhaps they're, they might be more vulnerable to long-term consequences of that. But, but I think that's a good thing. So the ones we're really interested in is those collegiate players who might go on and play professionally. You know, what happens to them when they're 40 and 50 mm-hmm. Are we going to see the same effects, the downstream effects, if you will, that we've we've started to see with some of these these kids who've played football and then right. gone on to you know collegiate professional careers? <clears throat> it's it's really interesting and and it's it's it's, it's a bit scary. Um, when I first started reading about your research, I came across the term head acceleration. And, you know, yes, I've taken physics in undergrad, but I had to really think about what that meant and how uh, a lower head acceleration force at, upon impact from a ball or whatever is a good thing. So would you mind talking us non-physicists through acceleration of the head and, and why we want it to be lower and that being a good thing when you get a header or an impact to the head? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, it's, I guess it's simple Newtonian physics and I'm, you know, I'm not a physicist by trade, but yeah. you know, to, it, I guess the good example is, you know, you think of this bobblehead effect, you know, and you have these bobbleheads and you, you tap on it and it wiggles and it goes back and forth and side to side. And we want, especially in the sport of soccer and you know that trickles into ice hockey football those sports that carry a high risk for concussion is that we want to eliminate that bobblehead effect and if we can slow that process down and create that 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 effect that's a good thing so i i liken it to you know when we when we teach the skill of soccer heading we want the body the neck and the head to all be one unit So 
when they go up to head the ball, it's one unit versus this bobblehead effect. And I think that it makes sense because if you, you know, you, you, you can't change the mass of the ball that's hitting the head. Yep. But one thing that you can ch ch change is certainly the mass of the body. And by making that one unit, hmm. the torso, the neck, and the head all connected, you're going to greatly increase that mass. So that's going to lower those accelerations. Right. And so getting that, that skill into soccer at an early age. And so, you know, kids in the United States can start heading the ball at the age of 11. So it's so important that we teach that skill properly, educate coaches to teach that skill properly to create that stiff body, neck, head segment. And moving forward, that's going to protect them a great deal because Jacqueline Cassis's work, Jacqueline is a former student of mine. She's at the Ohio State University now. And she had a seminal paper in that regard in which, you know, we looked at youth players, high school players, collegiate players. And across those three, three uh, age group levels, we saw that if we could lower the accelerations, it, it, the, the forces that the head saw were much better and so uh, <clears throat> yeah i mean it's all about teaching them that that's why you know we have a program i i actually helped create a program for the the uh, uh national soccer coaches association that uh is called get ahead safely in soccer and it's free it's it's you know it's distributed worldwide it's about a 30 minute uh, uh program that youth coaches, administrators can go and they can become certified in teaching kids proper technique of heading a soccer ball. Mm. And so it really, it just comes back to that, you know, Newtonian physics. If we can make that segment one, it's going to lower the accelerations. Right. So a, a big stiff pillar where the head and the Absolutely. body are, are one. And when you watch it, what's interesting, Scott, is when you watch players like uh, Ronaldo, uh, Messi, um, Abby Wambach during her career. When they had the ball, you can just see how stiff everything is. You know, it, it's really, a, a, it's truly an act of, 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 of true art and skill yeah. to see that. And, and that's why we're always concerned in the sport of soccer with errant shots in fact, in my class yesterday, I was talking to one of my students who's working with women or men's soccer. And I asked her what the mechanism of the concussion that this particular student athlete had, had suffered. And she said he got hit in the back of the head mm. with a soccer ball. He wasn't expecting it. Mm. And that's where a lot of concussions occur in soccer is that errant, errant shot, errant pass. And they're just not ready for it because I guarantee you, if, if the ball were coming in front of him, he would have been ready for it. Right. You know, you know, he's ready to head it. The and neck so could have stiffened up. Yeah. Right. It's really interesting. And uh, just to share a personal story, I, I grew up playing soccer and I was a goalie and I can recall like when I was asked to play out in the field, just randomly, you know, what maybe we were winning by a lot. They pulled a goalie, the goalie gets to have some fun on the field. I remember just being very fearful of having to head. I remember ducking down and, and not having the form that you talk about. So instead of taking it to the forehead, watching it come in, I've, I've heard you talk about keeping your eyes open and letting the ball hit you in the forehead. Sure. No, I would duck my head, let it hit me on the, on the top of the dome, eyes closed, and it could have gone anywhere. Who knows? But it really, all that to say, it, it practice matters. And I remember the guys who were really good at heading on my team, and it was usually the people that had the most reps. We didn't have the coach that sat us down and, and taught us how to do it. But, you know, of course, skills are, are going to be, you know, learned eventually and you sure. get hit enough times in the head, it's going to, it's going to sure. stick. Uh, but I can absolutely recall that the, the best people at heading the ball 
just just imagining them it's it's very stiff it's very purposeful their head will turn a little bit with the direction that they want the ball to go but like you said it, it's an art form and and for someone who's not trained it it looks entirely different it's like a ball hitting them in the head and they're you know like you said the bobblehead the bobblehead effect yeah yeah no question about it yeah yeah so it's interesting yeah. And it's great to hear, like, one, you provided a free resource for coaches that can now teach kids how to do this act, because that certainly wasn't around when I was growing up. I'm 28 now. And then you said, is, is it a question for you? Is this across the U.S. now that at the age of 11 is when kids can start heading the ball? Yeah, back in 2015, 2016, there was a clash at action suit against U.S. soccer. And so the, one of the, the downstream effects of that was the elimination of heading in players age 10 and, and younger. Between the ages of 11 and 13 is when they can begin to head the ball in practice and games. And so uh, the release of our program coincided pretty close to that. You know, there was very little guidance by the U.S. soccer for teaching coaches that. So a lot of coaches are reluctant. I'm just not going to teach it. Hmm. Well, that doesn't bode well because, you know, kids are still going to head the ball. They're going to have opportunities during games. So we created the program for coaches to be able to at least feel comfortable with teaching some of these basic skills. The other important aspect of that program is using lightweight balls. Hmm. Um, there's there's a ball out there called the the, the soccer trainer head, header trainer and it's it looks and feels just like a soccer ball whether it's size three four or five but it's lightweight it weighs like a, a beach ball so kids are much more reluctant to head a ball that doesn't hurt right. a, a size five header trainer ball versus a size five regulation soccer ball there's a huge difference so, you know, teaching the proper technique using lightweight balls, much better, much better. And then also, I believe in, in the Get Ahead Safely program, uh, there's some next strengthening that you teach the coaches to implement with their, with their athletes. Can you talk about the exercises that are used there? Because I imagine it's probably no equipment, easy to do, easy to perform, maybe with a partner. Could you walk us through what, what that looks like? Yeah, uh, exactly, Scott. That, that, that's what, you know, the intended purpose was, is that you need, to, you need to be able to impart these in a practice, whether it's two to three days a week, with very little equipment, because, right. you know, most, most teams are not going to have that. So it, it involves a lot of partner activities, isometric holds, uh, basic, uh, you know, neck range of motion. So whether it's flexion, extension, lateral flexion um, is really the goal to, to, to get them to strengthen the neck. And then in addition, there's, there's a little bit of trunk exercise in there as well to do some trunk activities, which, you know, is a good segue into, into your product, the next level. You know, when I first looked at this device, I thought, geez, this is, this is just going to, it's going to change what we do in terms of neck strengthening the bands. It's very easy to use that, that, you know, the, the rubber bands that, that you use for resistance. And so, um, you know, I, I honestly think it's truly the next level, uh, that we can, we can, we can take this and, and utilize it with our, uh, our soccer athletes. There are some very good evidence that's starting to come out with randomized control trials in our space, which is the soccer space, uh, a great publication by uh, Carrie Peak, who's a colleague, friend of mine. She's from the University of Sydney in Australia. Hmm. And this systematic review that she just published has come out and it's showing that neck strengthening can make a difference in lowering head acceleration. That's what we're all about, especially in the world of repetitive head impacts. So, you know, creating devices such as the next level strength, next strength, any device is really, I think it's, there's, there's room in this area for that. And Amanda's going to talk uh, here during the course of this morning, she's going to talk about our project that we've currently got going with the University of Delaware's women's soccer team. But we see that this is, you know, we're going to, we're going to 
push it out to our youth soccer population in the, in the spring. And uh, we, we think that there's room, there's definitely room for such a device there. And, you know, it's inexpensive and the, you know, the long-term the uh, benefits are gonna be immense for these kids, especially young, young kids. They've got to work on next strength because they're the ones where the bobblehead effect is, is most prevalent. You know, I don't concern myself with our collegiate players that much because mm -hmm. most of them are pretty well trained and skilled. Can they still improve neck strength? They can, but at least the technique is there. It's these young kids, it's, it, it, their necks are so weak. They, they can't even understand the technique. So. <clears throat> yeah. Right. And, and uh, have you watched young kids heading the ball? Like, I, I just have the image of like them just, you know, cutely running around and it bounces off the top of their head kind of like accidentally almost. It, it, have you watched them play? Is it, does it look bad? Is it, is it kind of cringy to see them head the ball? Do, does it look like it's just taking big hits to their head? What, what, what have you noticed? Yeah. You know, uh, one of my former students, uh, she just finished uh, Tori uh, Walquist. She, she and I did a lot of work where we, we filmed youth soccer players oh, okay. and uh, in the act of heading and without question there, there, there's some out there that you just kind of cringe like say, Oh, <laughs> part of the problem. If there is such a problem is again, they can't learn the skill until they're 11 years old. So as you know, in a motor development world, there's a lot of motor skill acquisition that occurs when you're younger and so uh, you know when they get to be 11 this is a, this is truly a new new skill for mm -hmm. them so learning that um, it takes some time it takes some repetition and so I think that learning it at 11 it, practice 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 by the time they're 15 and they're still playing they're pretty good at it but early on, hmm, it's it's pretty rugged. It's pretty rugged. Oh, man. It's funny <laughs> to think back and, you know, being in the generation before this was a concern, it, it's just funny to think back and how much trauma we probably caused each other. Um, but the brain's pretty resilient structure, so. Yeah. And thank goodness, thank goodness. Yeah. So there's some other equipment I would love to just uh, pick your brain about if we could real quick. Um, so there's Guardian helmet covers that um, college and football teams are using, college and pro football teams are using. Um, so would you, if someone hasn't seen these, would you mind explaining what these are and, and your thoughts on them? Yeah, um, it, it really is a revolutionary product. Um, it's a, it's a thin padded layer of uh, protection that goes over the, the helmet itself. And it, it, it really first came into play. I believe there were some researchers at Penn State University who mm -hmm. first looked at and examined the product. And uh, it, was a it was a doctoral dissertation, I believe. And it, it showed that over the course of, of a season, in practice anyways, that the, the forces that were seen on these helmets was much lower than without these, these guardian pads. And it was kind of futuristic, you know, it's, you know, they're kind of cumbersome. They sit on top of the helmet. They don't weigh a whole lot, but they sit on top of the helmet and they look kind of funky. Mm -hmm. And, and so I think even the research team at, at Penn state probably thought, ah, oh, nobody's going to buy into this. But when the study was done and they looked at the data, it was really revolutionary. And so, you know, it started there. And then if Penn State's doing it, every other Big Ten team is going to start doing it. Mm -hmm. And it just kind of, you know, it, it just exploded from there. I know at UD, I mean, all of our, our players during practice, mainly the two big days during the week are Tuesdays and Wednesdays where there's some hitting that goes on. They're all wearing that. And I think that's a good thing because, again, in the sport of American football, those repetitive head impacts can start to take a toll. And if the downstream effect of wearing these guardian protective devices can lower, you know, 
the 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 uh, the downstream effects of that, the the negative effects. You know, I'm all for it. I'm all for it, especially you know those offensive and defensive linemen where they're constantly hitting their heads and helmets during the course of a practice. You know, I think that they have got to be able to benefit from such a device, such a device. And like I said, they're lightweight. Uh, athletes have really bought into it. You know, 20 years ago, these athletes were not concerned about repetitive head impacts. They were not. And I think over the course of the 20 years, there's been rule changes in the sport of American football. Um, and I just think tackling is much better. And I just think there's a better awareness amongst the participants that, you know what, it's not smart for me to lead with my head anymore because, you know, I get done playing collegiately or professionally, they have a life they have to lead. So in fact, just last night, you know, my wife and I were talking about Cole Beasley, who he was a slot wide receiver for 11 years in the NFL and just recently signed with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And yesterday he, he just announced, I'm done with it. I'm, do, I'm done playing. I, I don't want to play anymore. You got to think how many hits he took going across the middle as a slot receiver. I don't blame the guy. Yeah, yeah. 11 years. I don't blame him. Uh, because again, you, you know, he's got a family, he's got a life to live. And so, yeah, I, I like them. I think they're a revolutionary product and they're here to stay. Yeah, no, it, it's kind of funny. Like you, you think about like, what do you think of this product? What do you think of that product? Really, it's anything that moves uh, the ball forward is, is a good thing. If it's going to lower head impacts, however silly it looks, it really doesn't matter. Anything is in, in, the, in that direction is a, is a good thing. It also makes me think of the, the Q caller. Are you, are you guys familiar with that? I am, yeah. The, uh, uh, yeah, so where it, it monitors blood flow through the arteries in your neck, right. and which is obviously leading up to the brain. So, yeah, the, yeah. the concept there was amazing. Uh, they developed it out of uh, thinking how woodpeckers can possibly survive Correct. all those head impacts without, you know, dying of a repeated concussions Correct. or whatever. And so the, the cue collar builds up uh, jugular vein pressure within the brain, thinking that that'll decrease the slosh of the head of the brain within the skull. And so that's just another example of really, really interesting things that's that's going on. Um, I actually just got to interview the, the head physical therapist for Team USA Rugby, and and we were talking all about how tackling form is completely different in the in the rugby world versus in, in in football. Where in football you have this helmet, so you feel encouraged to mm. use it as a weapon for tackling or or blocking whatever. Whereas in rugby. You, you have to stay away from, from a, a knee to the head right. or, um, you know, you, you certainly aren't going to lead with your head. So it's just really interesting to think about how equipment plays a role in, in tackling form. It does. And, you know, U.S. So or U.S. football, um, you know, they, they've made it a, a concerted effort to make sure that coaches are teaching what they call heads up football. So see the numbers versus, you know, head down, see the numbers and bringing into place some of those tackling techniques that for years have benefited rugby players because they're mm. good at tackling. They have to be. And like you said, they, they have to look up, they have to see things. Right. So, you know, parting those same skills into a football athlete, I think are important. Yes, very much so. And mm -hmm. uh, Amanda, I'd, I'd love to, uh, to bring you in here. Would you mind telling us about uh, what the University of Delaware is doing with the next level and, and your next strengthening studies that you guys have underway um, going on this fall? Yeah, so we have a couple girls on the women's soccer team here at Delaware in an eight-week program using the next level. So we kind of developed a next strengthening protocol with it so we can progress them through those eight weeks and hopefully obviously strengthen their neck muscles. Mm -hmm. So we're currently on week seven, almost on eight, week eight. And before we started the strengthening program, we got some basic neck strength measures using just a handheld dynamometer. 
on all motions, so flexion, extension, bending, and rotation. And then uh, when the eight weeks is over with, we're going to retest and see any improvements. But so far, the program's been going very well. It's really easy to implement with the athletes. I either have them do it after their strength and conditioning program here, just in the gym. They can easily do it on the floor. Or sometimes I go to their rehab sessions if they're in rehab and I can do it on the PT table after their rehab session. So it's been amazing that it's very easy to just bring anywhere and use essentially anywhere. I've also been able just to go after their yoga sessions and just give them a yoga mat and they can just do it on the floor. Of the their yoga sessions. So it's been very convenient that it's very mobile and you don't have to attach it to anything. It can just be done on the floor, on a table, in the weight room, anywhere. That's great to hear. Um, I almost feel bad that they have to use the next lower after a nice calming yoga session and you got to do some neck strengthening right after that. That's a, that's a tough turnaround. Uh, and Scott, let me just interject too. You know, Amanda said a couple, but we actually, I think there are nine student athletes that we have participating in, in that particular project. We're actually looking to maybe uh, expand during their off season and maybe get some of the girls who did not participate during the fall in season uh, to maybe open it up to them during the, their spring off season. Uh, and so, you know, the more, the, the bigger the end, the better off we're going to be. But I think I, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic that some of the things we're going to see here postseason are going to be very, very favorable. That's great. Um, I do have a dog barking in the background. I'm sorry. I don't know if that can be heard. Uh, so just uh, just to uh, spell it out, when we talk about dynamometry measures for for neck strength, we are we're talking about a handheld dynamometer where the maybe you could explain the scenario for how to measure neck strength, just in case someone has it in the clinic and they want to implement this in their practice. The athletes um, maybe sitting up tall as their torso secured. Can you just walk us through the mechanics of it. Yeah. So for them, when we did the testing, it was just easier to do it on the field for us. So we had them sitting down on the bleachers actually. And I kind of just had them in a row and I lined them up and was easily able to, we started off with flexion and I kind of demonstrated it for them, put it on their forehead, told them to press down as hard as they can kind of bring their chin down for three seconds and I counted the three seconds for them and said, push, push, push. And they were able to kind of see how strong they could get. Mm -hmm. I was telling them their numbers. So they knew kind of what to look for, what to get. Uh, so for the dynamometer, you just want to be mindful of where you're placing it uh, for different metrics. There's obviously different ways of placing it. The best way we found to do it was to have them seated so they're not trying to use like their legs and pushing into the ground and leaning too much with the torso. When we had them do extension, they were sitting back in the chair so that it wasn't like they could push back yeah. and lean back into it. So their back was secured. And then we just had them do the side bending ones as well. It's very simple. For us to be able to get those strength numbers and it was able to get all of them kind of at the same time and just kind of went down. So the handheld dynamometers are very easy and simple to use for us and you can easily get the metrics that we we're looking for. Uh, I think that's like the most important thing is trying to make it something that's not super long for all of these athletes. They got a lot of things to do. They don't have that much time between practice and lifts and all the other things they have going on. So being able to go to the field, assess their strength on the field and just have an easy device that can do that with the proper placements and having them seated was amazing. Uh, yeah. And I, I'll just interject too, that, you know, I think that we're, we're efficient, but effective efficient, but effective. And as Amanda indicated, you know, one of the things that we, we want to try to eliminate is as much trunk 
uh, spillover as possible because we really want to concentrate on the neck. So, you know, we, we utilize uh, good stabilization techniques. You know, we're holding one hand is holding the dynamometer. Our other hand is on their shoulders to eliminate any extraneous motions because we realize that is that is literally our outcome measure. We, we need to be as sound as we possibly can. And Amanda, if, correct me if I'm wrong, we're also doing a, a girth measurement. Is that correct around the neck? Correct. We so we're measuring well? girth pre and post behaviors. Yeah. <clears throat> Great. And then uh, I was talking with uh, someone you guys are both probably familiar with, Ariel Giordano, last night. She's a physical therapist across the street from you guys. And she was asking, are, are they going to also be looking at uh, concussion incidents in, in, in their season, in the, in the women's soccer season? And I said, I don't know. I'm not sure if we are. Uh, do, do you guys know if that is going to be tracked and, um, or not? I think yeah. that's probably a good plan for moving forward. Um, I think the one thing we want to do is kind of knock out a good uh, program for neck strengthening first. Mm -hmm. and make sure we have that all solidified, which is kind of the main focus of this initial project. Uh, and then we can, once we know that is improving, uh, if we need to tweak anything in the program, we can, then we can kind of move forward and look into uh, concussion incidences. Yeah. I think we can, we can, we're, we're pretty comfortable saying that of the nine or 10 girls that are in the study right now, none of them have had a concussion, knock on wood. Again, we're, as Amanda said, we're approaching that eight week period. So they're finishing that eight week uh, training period. Um, so yeah, I, I agree moving forward, you know, because we have a population of soccer players right now who are not doing the study. Right. And so, you know, we, we potentially could look at, you know, their concussion incidents versus the ones that are in the study. But, you know, it's hope that, you know, that that is a downstream effect. You know, we want them to get stronger, but perhaps it's also mitigating their concussion risk as well. And that's the, that's the holy grail. That's what I think everybody here is, is after. Uh, so, Amanda, would, would you mind telling us about how you came into contact with Dr. K? What got you interested in studying underneath him and, and how your PhD program has been going? Of course. So I did my undergrad and my master's at the University of Dayton. And while I was there, I got into a biomechanics lab and was looking at balance and some other metrics. But my main focus was and passion is injury prevention. So when I was playing soccer, I was in middle school, I took a header off the wrong part of my head. And that was the first time I had a concussion. And I didn't really know much about concussions back then and decided to take a class at Dayton. And we of course talked about the Antonio Brown concussion mm -hmm. and learned some more about concussions, did some helmet designs. And I was kind of looking around at PhD programs and Delaware's program kind of has a specific biomechanics program that really kind of brought attention to me. So I decided to look at the faculty members that taught kind of in the biomechanics realm and Dr. K's lab stood out to me. I really think that concussions as well as ankle sprains was just some of the other stuff he does are two of the big areas that are really interesting for me. I'm also on top of being into soccer and very big into football as well. So I feel like that has a nice uh, kind of overlay between those two sports. Yeah. So, yeah, and you know, she, the other, she downplays this, but you know, she, she has a passionate interest in sport performance and, you know, she's worked, during the summer, she's worked at a uh, biomechanics lab up in uh, North Philly, and she really has a knack for sport performance. And so her, the ability now for her to be involved with our sport performance team at the University of Delaware has just, it's, it's proven to be very, very worthwhile uh, partnership for us. Because Amanda is there working with the student athletes, not only in our women's soccer team, but other student athletes. 
And, she, you know, she has access to a ton of, ton of data that, you know, UD Athletics is interested. They have the data. Amanda has the capability to take that data and make it useful to a coach, to an athletic trainer, to the strength and conditioning staff. So that partnership is really proven to be um, A plus plus. It's great. And it's amazing how much technology has, has grown around the athletics world for college and pro sports. And then even for, you know, for youth athletics, like uh, I, I know now that you know, like just like a, 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 a parent will strap some kind of device on their kid during a soccer game. And then they're watching how much they're running around the field. And be like my, my boy's peak acceleration today was, you know, whatever, 20 miles. It's hilarious that, you know, kids, their parents can monitor this stuff. Now uh, there's so much, so much technology and so much data coming in. So like you said, having Amanda here to be able to go through um, all the data processing it is is really important stuff because somebody's got to do it and, and somebody has to do it well mm -hmm. uh, so those are all the uh, the topics the questions i wanted to discuss with you guys today i thought it was a really awesome time to talk to you um, any parting thoughts on uh, on concussions neck safety uh, neck strengthening anything like that yeah you know i just said you know let your audience know that this is an ongoing process. I think we're, we're just starting to see the, 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 the dividends pay off from not only, you know, the padded protection in the sport of American football, but the effects of neck strengthening and mitigating concussion risk. I think there's going to be explosion in the next few, few, few years, I think of data that's going to come forth from projects that we have. So. Yeah. Uh, very good. Uh, well, guys, thank you both for uh, for your time today. Uh, looking forward to posting this and uh, and hearing what uh, what people have to say. So, thank you both. Sounds good, Scott. Thanks again, and uh, we'll be in touch. We'll let you know with this this uh, this grant proposal that we got forth. So, hopefully, we hear pretty soon. We just submitted it this week, so hopefully, we hear soon. So we can get on your radar to get those additional units ready for our spring project. So 